Hey nerds, Farmer Jesse here. Welcome to Growers Daily, your daily dose of ecological farming insight. It is Thursday, June 19th, 2025, and today we're going to talk about if compost counts as a crop in a rotation, ants, that's it, just ants, and crop planning tips for a CSA. So let's do it. All right. Well, a uh, glorious Thursday to you all. I hope everyone is doing well on this Juneteenth. Uh, let's see. I did absolutely nothing yesterday, but not by choice. As I've mentioned before on the show, I suffer from back issues and I must have aggravated it somehow because I was pretty much uh, laid out all day yesterday and could do practically nothing. Back pain is hard to describe, but uh, it absolutely takes the breath out of you. And when the fulcrum of your entire body, like your hips and your back area, your lower back, is in pain, it's hard to do much of anything, but just lay around. Luckily, I was able to get an appointment with our chiropractor, and I'm feeling better today, but quite sore. Uh, as I've mentioned before, my back issues are becoming a like central figure in our current farm structure, i.e. how it is currently much smaller than it used to be. Uh, plus, it's future design with us slowly moving away from stuff that grows on the ground to more more crops that grow uh, at head or hip height, at least. So if there is a lesson there, it's take care of your back, find a good chiropractor, and don't do what I did to hurt my back, whatever that was. Anyway, as has become the tradition on Thursdays, we will attempt to catch up on some of our Patreon questions. Today, we will start with this fun one from Casista, who asks, quote, does deep compost application count as a crop rotation? I add about 14 inches of compost to my beds on a two to three year rotation. On off years, they just get spent hay. I feel like burying the beds that deep probably counts as crop rotation. Thoughts? How deep would be deep enough that you would consider deep compost to be bioequivalent to rotating crops? End quote. Okay, so great questions here. And I know some versions of this question have come up lately in terms of crop rotations, but not exactly this question. So let's look at it a little bit deeper in terms of well, deep compost. Uh, the short answer is maybe the compost will do enough to alleviate some of the risks of not rotating crops, but it depends. Depends on what? Well, it depends on the crop or crops you are growing, the quality of the compost, the depth of the compost, and your climate. So, for instance, unless you're putting down like 18 inches of the compost on your soil every year, which would require its own mortgage for a small farm to buy that much compost and probably uh, create all sorts of other environmental issues, your roots will still sink deep into the native soil. So the compost itself, although some benefits will move deep into the soil, won't inherently protect the plants that deep. A shallower rooted crop like lettuce, uh, you will likely be fine without rotating too much. But if you're in a drier region, then perhaps any pathogen buildup may not dissipate quite as fast and could pose risks. I'm not saying it won't work, and people often point to specific examples of it working for certain growers, and that's great for them. For you, if you can at all help it involve compost, absolutely, but still rotate your crops and avoid just to avoid that risk. All that said, if you can't rotate your crops, then good healthy nutritional compost is probably going to be the best mitigation strategy. With all those responsible caveats out of the way, there are some interesting relatively recent studies about the disease suppressive abilities of compost and soil. One recent review of the literature about this particular subject detailed the way in which well-made compost can be a quote, suitable tool for biological control of soil-borne pathogens, end quote. Basically, not only uh, could compost be a source of nutrients and organic matter, obviously, but compost can also be a part of an approach to disease suppression, and in fact, on larger scales, which is not necessarily a conversation I've heard a lot before finding that particular paper, uh, just like compost as a uh, pest mitigation strategy. In fact, there is more and more research that links compost to disease and pest suppression in a way that will surprise none of us, but does lend itself a little bit more to the your idea of using it as a quote-unquote crop. Now, however, compost can also have the opposite effect because since we've discussed before, not all compost are created equal. So I think that in a way, the compost could indeed be uh, considered a quote-unquote crop in the rotation, but the quality will determine how effective that is. I mean, let's be honest, they should really just call farming contexting because uh, that's really what it is context management. Anyway, let me know your thoughts and we'll take a quick break. When we come back, got ants in our plants. That's terrible. BRB. Dreams of you and me. Sky high, busy 
Today's episode is brought to you by Farmhand. If you're listening to this, you probably found five rare minutes to breathe, but what got pushed back further down the to-do list to make that happen? If it's your CSA newsletter, you're not alone. Farmhand's new newsletter builder was made for busy farmers. It automates weekly emails, drives add-on sales, and makes it easy to keep your customers in the loop without spending hours behind a screen. It launches this summer, but our listeners can request early access now. Visit farmhand.partners slash no-till. That's farmhand.partners slash no-till. All right, back to the show. If you, the listener, are enjoying this podcast, getting even a small amount of value from it, consider supporting our work over at patreon.com slash no till growers. I will try to get to questions from everywhere that questions come in, but I will always get to your Patreon questions. Now, today's second Patreon question of the day comes to us from Patreon member Martin Kumaru, who writes, quote, hello again from Denmark, not Holland. Ha ha. Yes, indeed. Sorry about that. Do you have any suggestions on how best to deal with an overabundance of ants without using poison? I don't mind the little critters normally, but I have so many right now that I can't sieve my compost pile or plant seedlings in a raised bed without them going nuts on me. And their bites do sting a bit. I wanted to follow the adage of you don't have a slug problem, you have a duck deficiency by getting an ant eater. You don't have an ant problem, you have an ant eater deficiency, but my wife vetoed it as it was quote unquote impractical and quote unquote highly illegal end quote. Uh, all right, great question. In fact, uh, ants have become somewhat of a spectacular burden on us as well here where they are not just making nests in every conceivable nook and cranny of the farm, but they are also farming aphids on a more aggressive scale in our plant starts, specifically in our cucurbits. So the ants are becoming a small issue in the greenhouse that I imagine will be even more of a nuisance next season. Luckily, those ants that I'm describing are not necessarily what you're describing because ours uh, do not bite, but they do stink, which uh, sometimes feels like the same thing. Now, the thing is, I actually quite like ants. They can do really good things for the soil. They eat weed seeds, they aerate, they farm. Uh, so there is some solidarity there. And I've talked a bit about uh, sort of mitigation strategies for fire ants in the past. But ants are truly a difficult challenge because they are so adaptive and clever and well unseen until they are on you. They are also able to defend themselves incredibly well from predation, save for things like ant eaters, which I agree, I could use one as well. They're also pretty cute. Now, you uh, won't likely be able to eradicate them in a garden, the ants, but let's first talk about balancing out their populations with an ecological approach, or at least more natural approaches. There are some uh, creatures that are not technically ant eaters or cute little pangolins that do eat ants and encouraging their habitat may be a helpful place to start. Some woodpeckers and other birds are pretty good little ant eaters. You will occasionally see them on the ground pecking away at ant colonies, which is pretty neat. Lizards, toads, and frogs can also eat ants, although I'm not particularly sure how abundant those are in Denmark. Snakes are an animal that will eat ants as well, so hopefully there are a few uh, non-threatening snakes around that can help you out there. There are a decent amount of bugs too as well, like the assassin bug, doodle bugs, various beetles and spiders, uh, wasps, the unheralded king of garden pest management, also dine on ants. Then there are some microbial predators uh, as well, such as the cordyceps fungi, which, well, watch The Last of Us and just think about ants instead of humans. And, and probably uh, don't do it right before you go to bed. Encouraging the habitat for some of those uh, may help over time, but will obviously not address any acute issues, especially not in the garden. In the house, we've had success deterring ants or keeping their numbers down by mixing one part boron with three parts sugar uh, dissolved into some water and letting them drink that. It does seem to work, at least for a time, to get them to kind of go away, but they will eventually wise up again. Not sure that would be helpful in a garden unless you can keep other stuff out of the boron mixture. Pouring boiling water on some colonies is uh, one remedy that has shown some efficacy, as I've discussed in this segment on fire ants a while back. Uh, you will hear things like combining ant hills to trying to get them to fight each other, which is not generally effective according to the research. Now, there are some location-specific options for ants in various regions, like certain parasitoid flies here in the U.S. or a couple different pathogens down in Argentina that have shown some efficacy. Uh, so it would be worth contacting local entomologists in your area and asking if there's anything like that locally. Uh, it's a bit harder for me to see the research in Denmark for the language barrier, obviously, uh, but there's probably something there. In the compost pile, you have the option of just turning it more often to shake up their nests. They, In general, like most creatures, they, they don't love that. There are some uh, natural insecticides out there, like, for instance, the Omri certified spinosad, but the results are somewhat mixed. And also, I don't know, there's some controversy of whether or not that is a good uh, thing to use because it can be a little broad spectrum. In short, it takes a multi-pronged approach to really just keep ants in check. And even on our farm, it feels like an often losing battle. My general philosophy, though, is at some point, some 
some creature will recognize this incredible food source and take advantage. That is, by and large, how nature likes to roll. So I say encouraging habitats, taking uh, little measures like very carefully pouring boiling water on the nest so long as they are not near your plants, because boiling water on plant roots is not great. And perhaps keeping uh, those areas where they like to live is disturbed as much as makes sense for your situation, like occasionally turning that compost pile. That should cut down on their populations until the time when you finally talk your partner into uh, that anteater, which you probably shouldn't do because they're probably right. It probably is illegal. All right. I think that's it for ants. Up next, we're going to take a quick break. And when we return, how to plan for a weekly basket of veggies. Be right back. Today's episode is brought to you by Farm Raise. Still struggling with your balance sheet? Your lender's asking for a balance sheet and you're stuck with a spreadsheet mess or guessing your numbers? Farm Raise Tracks takes the stress out of farm finance. With one click, you can generate an accurate, up-to-date balance sheet that shows your assets, liabilities, and equity, no accounting degree required. You'll be ready for loan applications, tax season, or just a clearer picture of where your farm stands. Join thousands of farmers using tracks to build stronger businesses. Get 20% off with code NOTILL20 at farmraise.com for the lifetime of your membership. All right, back to the show. All right, our third and final question of the day comes to us from Patreon member Austin at Vital Root Farm, who asks, quote, hey, Jesse, wondering if you could do a segment on how to think about crop planning for a CSA. Market farming sometimes seems challenging enough. Planning for the consistency and variety needed to make it through a full CSA season seems at times out of reach. So many different days to maturity, combined with changing weather, combined with crop successes and failures, it all seems like a moving target, especially when you're just getting started. Thoughts? Thanks? End quote. Okay, so great questions here. First, I should say right off the bat that you're right about the complications here. And generally, if you are not a super experienced grower, I would not start with a CSA because it depends so much on you being good at growing so many different crops. Just for the uninitiated, a CSA is like a weekly subscription to uh, vegetables or flowers or whatever it is. So oftentimes you're getting something different or at least a range of different things every week for a given period. Usually for us, our CSAs would run for like 20 weeks with like a 10 week fall add-on and then sometimes we did a winter CSA. So in effect you have to know how to grow a bunch of different crops well or expect and budget for buying in some crops that larger growers uh, can grow well to supplement what you can't grow consistently yourself yet. Anyway, with that sort of caveat out of the way, there are so many ways to do CSA crop planning, but I will give you my biggest tips from our many years, roughly a decade of running all or growing for a CSA. First, for me, storage crops are king in a CSA. Those early weeks start with having some sweet potatoes and maybe even some winter squash left from the fall before. Those are two crops that can enable you to start your CSA in the early spring without it being straight up grains every week, you know, just like lettuce on lettuce on lettuce. But throughout the season, being able to pop some potatoes into the week's share or some more onions or shallots or garlic just as needed is incredibly helpful and takes a little bit of the stress off of having to have something new every single week. I also like herbs like basil, parsley, thyme, sage, and others. The, those are good filler that you can kind of just pop in and out uh, throughout the season when you want maybe one more item to make it more interesting. Uh, second big tip is squash and zucchini are great for CSAs for like two weeks. And then for two weeks, you need to find somewhere else for them to go. Uh, what I mean is that no one wants six or eight straight weeks of squash or for that matter, eggplant, or maybe even peppers. So what we've done is give those things like the squash for like two weeks, then uh, take it solely to market for two weeks. And then we come back to the CSA for like a week or so. And then maybe we take another two weeks off or whatever. Like we give them two weeks in a row, two weeks off, then one or two weeks on, then another like one or two weeks off. That way we're not overloading them. Another tip is to have some sunflower and pea seeds on hand in case you see a gap coming up in the couple in the next couple weeks that you can throw a round of microgreens in the share in case of emergencies. Now, in terms of crop planning well so that you don't have too many of those gaps, though they happen some years for unexpected reasons. This year we already have over like 40 inches of rain, which has wreaked havoc on our carrot bed. So Things like that happen, so it's nice to have a backup crop just in case, like those microgreens or like, you know, those herbs or whatever. But anyway, in terms of crop planning, I like to work backward. Uh, start with what you want to give in each week's share and start filling in what you will need to achieve that, like when you'll need to plant it, when you'll need to start harvesting it. This will require taking very good notes throughout the growing season to dial in how long it takes to mature what crop at what time of year. But that's the idea. If I want arugula, for instance, in late August, I know I will want to sow that by the end of July. So I will make sure there is a bed open around that time. Then you just have to do that for each of your shares and each of the crops and start 
putting the puzzle together slowly. And that will get easier every year as you take notes. Uh, my last tip is just to have at least one other outlet to ensure you have a place for stuff to go. This is not a requisite, but if you have a farm store on your property or a friend has one, or you have a chef's contact you can hit up uh, when you're flush with you know a certain crop or whatever, that can help in times when you just have too much of one crop. Okay, I lied. This is, this is actually my last tip. You should grow a variety of stuff that people like, but your time and labor still matter. So just growing slow, low profitable crops will still limit your own profitability, even though people have paid you up front for it. This can be a little hard uh, to wrap your brain around in a CSA. But in other words, if you just grow watermelons and sweet corn and tomatoes, that's like stuff that people really want, that will limit the number of CSA memberships you can offer because that will take up so much space and time in your garden. And that will ultimately cut into your profitability. So you do have to mix in faster growing stuff, uh, radishes and lettuces and arugula and that sort of thing to make sure that you are uh, using your space as best you can. Because annoyingly, we all do have to make money to keep our farms going. Anyway, I hope that was helpful. CSA growers, please feel free to add your tips in the comments. Uh, we'll talk about those on tomorrow, also known as Friday, but more famously known as Feedback Friday. Otherwise, we're done here Thursday. Don't forget, No-Till Growers is now officially a nonprofit 501c3, so donations are tax deductible and greatly appreciated. Please make sure to like and subscribe and or follow wherever you're getting this podcast. That's an easy way to help us out. Enormous thank you to all of our show sponsors. And if you'd ever like to sponsor this show, you can reach out to Farmer Michelle at no -till Growers growers.com. Huge shouts to Willie Breeding for the theme music, Mike Hilbert for the production help and editing, and the team at No-Till Growers. Also, shouts to Epidemic Sound for the background music that you can hear. Pick up a copy of the Living Soil Handbook of the Seed Farmer at No-Till to support our work. Big, big thank you to everyone over at Patreon.com slash No-Till Growers, where at a certain level, or if you just bump up from one level to another, or you sign up in the month of June, Still June, right? Yeah, June, you get a shout out on the show. So big shout outs today to Forest People Farm Japan. That's fun. That sounds like a fun place to visit. I got to get to Japan one of these days. All right, so Tobias and John walk back to the cave. Well, you will remember uh, John had woken up uh, having presumably time traveled. Uh, an hour or so before. There was a growing pile of veggies in the cave now uh, and fruits and all sorts of stuff. And John had never seen so much fresh food in his life. There were pockets of the United States and Canada that still grew food, obviously, and, and lots of uh, indoor production. But to see it all together like that in a in a pile like that, John estimated was probably like six feet tall by like eight feet you know, wide. It must have been worth hundreds, if not hundreds of thousands of dollars. Tobias confirms this is likely the, the truth, that it was so valuable. The reason they need John, in fact, was not to get it, the food back safely. They could do that kind of on their own. Tobias warns him, however, his job is to protect it until the crew can come pick it up the next day. That evening, John is instructed to build his bed on top of the produce, the giant pile in the cave, and once again, place the small flat box beneath his pillow. The next day, Tobias tells him he will wake up back at home and have to help the crew move the produce back to the diner. But it won't be that easy because, well, we'll talk about that tomorrow on the Maritime Food Company. Sure. All right. Thanks for watching and or listening. We will see you then. Bye. Penguins are cute, though. I mean, I would take a penguin. Touch mm -hmm.